addressing challenges for women in PNG. Tourism development focus for Morobe. And Whistle aiming for Pacific Games. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. This is Monday's News. Thank you for joining us. The Department for Community Development and Religion today hosted an event to commemorate the National Women's Day. With the theme, Balance for Better, Women in Leadership, the event focused on addressing the challenges women face as leaders in the country. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, in his keynote address, said women have played a key role in society and for many years people have failed to recognize their role in leadership. The event saw women leaders in all private and government organizations participate in a panel discussion to discuss challenges they face in their line of work. They highlighted some experiences and challenges they face as leaders. In opening the panel discussion, Department of Justice and Attorney General Secretary Dr. Eric Kwa said leadership starts with the family and local communities. So that means that there must be something happening within our communities. That must mean that women are being respected. That must mean that women are being given opportunities. That must mean that women are being accepted as a partner within communities, within villages. Department of Community Development and Religion Minister Soroy Ewe, in addressing the women, acknowledged all women leaders for their role in development. He said women play an important role in the family, community, and the country as a whole. For thousands of years that our mothers have struggled, to feed the families, to go to the gardens, to collect firewood, to support and cooking for the families, up until now. All culminated, I guess, to this time in history of this country. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill in his keynote address said for many years the country has failed to recognize the efforts of women. He said in the past seven years his government has been appointing women to take up leadership roles in most government agencies. They have the right to be in that position. And we are proud of the work that they are doing. Right for various positions, both in diplomatic posting and heads of departments or heads of statutory bodies you will find that where women are placed in responsible positions, they are performing very, very well. Department of Community Development and Religion Secretary Anna Solomon also highlighted some of the department's plans in addressing issues faced by women in the country. We are women who have been victims for too long. We don't want to be victims, we want to be empowered. Let's talk to the right forum, which is men, and they will help us address these issues. The National Women's Day is commemorated on the 24th of March every year. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Now MP Kennedy Wenge is planning on establishing a tourism development program for Morabe province. In a recent move, Mr Wenge supported the DCA Beachfront project initiated by unemployed youth. In his capacity as Tourism Promotion Authority Board Chairman, he said such initiatives are promising for tourism in Morabe province. In a small presentation ceremony, Mr. Wenge, along with representatives from the Morbe Tourism Bureau and the Tourism Promotion Authority, donated caps to youths. He said those small the presentation was to acknowledge the initiative to beautify the beach front. The youths planted trees and flowers to provide shade and beautify the area. Mr. Wenge said little initiatives as such will promote tourism. <laughs> You know, white skins are sold, money come low, tariff, pori, low, upside, come magarima, na come come up low, this year. All money come low, mumma, see, finish low, we work one more, come down, low, meteng, meteng come come up low, yeah, you will go out in mall. You know, all that's all, all land low, two legion below, you mean two, losing pillow blanket, or pins up in a come come up low, yeah. The TPA board chairman added that he will be working with the provincial administration and the Morbe governor to establish the tourism promotion program soon. TPA board secretary Colin Timebury says Morbe province has a lot to offer in terms of tourism but needs the backing of the provincial government. The Morbe province for that matter is lucky that you have a, a member of your government, your provincial government and a member of your province that is a 
uh, uh, the chairman of the Tourism Promotion Authority Board. Uh, there's a lot of uh, promise in this province and we want to work together with the provincial government and uh, all stakeholders, industry members to, to drive tourism development. So hopefully this is a start and uh, something that uh, can take us to uh, bigger things uh, in terms of tourism development in Morobe. Isaac Manu, the leader of the youth group who initiated the beachfront project, says he wants more recognition and support to continue the work they've started. Shalin Eri, National MTV News, Lay. The Creative Arts Faculty at the University of Papua New Guinea has forged a partnership with a rising fashion platform, PNG Fashion Week. The creative and cultural industries in the country are evolving at a rapid rate with the inclusion of new technology and innovative ideas. Hence, this opportunity for students from the Creative Arts Faculty to broaden their skills and knowledge of the industry. Six students have been selected as a start to undergo their internship with PNG Fashion Week. The objective is to nurture our students to create opportunities for them uh, within the industry. Um, so it's quite an honor to partner with the university. We thought, look, let's partner with an institution that's been around for a while, um, an institution that um, develops. I mean, it, it creates uh, and, and nurtures and grows most of our people, most of our, our country come from UPNG. So, so what, a, what an honor and a privilege to partner with the university to be a part of that pro process. Having PNG Fashion Week on board means a lot to the way students will learn, not only in the classroom, but on site where things happen for real. So, you know, it's a privilege actually. I, I thought about this for a while, never had the opportunity to meet Phil until I saw her during registration. And I said, I told myself I need to f meet with this lady, I need to get her on board with my assessment. And we finally met and got this rolling. So our students actually started on Saturday. Yeah, with Monday's news, we go for a break and be back with more of the day stories when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. In the lead-up to its referendum exercise in the autonomous region of Bougainville, the people of Bougainville have been urged to work together to ensure the outcome of this vote is free and fair. A recent delegation comprising representatives from the national government, autonomous Bougainville government and the United Nations began the first round of referendum awareness which saw the team speak to over 15,000 people in total. Autonomous Bougainville Government President Chief John Mommis recently led a high-level delegation from the ABG, National Government and the United Nations for the first round of referendum awareness. Among the delegation, Minister Assisting the Prime Minister on Bougainville Affairs, William Sam, and UN Resident Coordinator Gianluca Rampola. Over the course of a week and a half, an estimated more than 15,000 people attended the awareness sessions an indication of the desire for information from the people of Bougainville as they prepare for the vote to determine their political future. Among the highlights of this first round of awareness, meeting with representatives of the Mekamui government in Panguna where the crisis began. The Mekamui in recent months have affirmed their support for the referendum with its leaders committing to the joint weapons disposal program, a key pillar of the Bougainville peace agreement. According to Minister Assisting the Prime Minister on Bougainville Affairs, William Sam, the spirit of partnership and cooperation has been positive and needs to continue up until and after the referendum is completed. Minister Sam adding that Bougainville remains an integral part of Papua New Guinea, with the national government committed to supporting the people of Bougainville to ensuring that the referendum is conducted in a free and fair manner. The message to take back to PNG, I believe, is that um, uh, we got to manage uh, uh, our people's expectation on Bougainville in the spirit and the context of the peace agreement. Uh, I think uh, we, if we implement the peace agreement as it is, there shouldn't be any issues. Of course, there will be motions here and there, but uh, I think uh, coming to know Bougainvilleans, they're good. Uh, uh, breed of people that I'm um, really uh, enjoying interacting with them at the moment. For ABG President Chief John Mommis, preparations towards the referendum exercise, now confirmed for October the 12th this year, have truly begun, with the President noticing a spirit of unity among communities where the awareness team has visited. 
He says this must continue to ensure a credible outcome for the autonomous region. We are very privileged, you know. The Bowen Billions are now being given uh, this unique opportunity to determine their own future. But the, the right, the, you know, that the, the right of self-determination, which belongs to everybody, in our case is, uh, is modified or must be implemented within the context of the Bowen Peace Agreement. Much of the support from outside of Papua New Guinea has been channeled through the United Nations system in PNG. The UN resident coordinator, Gianluca Rampola, when speaking to MTV News, also reaffirmed the commitment of development partners to the people of Bougainville, a commitment born out of the willingness of the people to uphold the Bougainville peace agreement, one of very few peace agreements that has stood the test of time. There's been a first for many of these events, and, and that's what the UN is there for, is to convene, to bring everyone together and make sure that there is dialogue. And that's what we're here for, ensure that everyone can talk. And as you say in Beijing, talk, talk is the way forward. And in the, in the Melanesian culture, that is what will enable and has always enabled to find solutions, is dialogue. Whilst there have been some concerns raised on the perceived timing of awareness efforts on Bougainville, it has been noted that with the referendum date now set, the people of Bougainville are now more determined than ever to ensure that their decision through the ballot come October is taken note of. The Gerhu General Hospital in the nation's capital recently held a celebration to commemorate World Tuberculosis Day. With the theme, Unite to End TB, the event focused on giving awareness to people about the killer disease. Experts say there are over 36,000 cases of TB in NCD alone, with over 600 cases of drug-resistant TB registered at the Port Moresby General Hospital. A shortage of drugs is also a major challenge faced by hospitals around the country. The small but significant event saw members of the general public all attended to know more about the killer disease. Members from the different health NGOs also participated in the event to give awareness on how to prevent the disease. I think this team is very important for Papua New Guinea. Why is it time we ask ourselves? TB has been with us for many, many years. It's a great challenge to all of us in the hospital and in health services. TB is our leading cause of admission every day hospital admission, death, mortality, and mobility. A TB advocate from the Gerau General Hospital when speaking at the event said there are 36,000 confirmed cases of TB in NCD alone since 2017. She said TB has been the main cause of admission in all hospitals in NCD and the country. Uh, for Port Mosby and NCD, uh, confirmed cases 2017 is 36,000 TB cases. And uh, out of these uh, TB cases, 25% of them are in urban areas and population in NCD. So squatter settlement, overcrowding, and these kinds that contribute to a high number of cases of TB. She also highlighted some of the major challenges they are facing in fighting TB. She also revealed that there are 600 cases of drug-resistant TB at the Port Mosby General Hospital. So TB is really growing and it's becoming resistant to our treatment and it's a problem that we must really address. For confirmed cases at Port Mosby General Hospital, we have 600 multi-drug resistant on second line drug and extremely drug resistant, we have 10. Uh, these are registered at the main hospital at Port Mosby General and then they're dispersed to the urban health center to continue their treatment. Another officer from the Gerau General Hospital also expressed concerns that medical drugs are a big challenge for most hospitals in the country. We have encountered so far is the inadequacy of medical supplies. I would say the N95 masks, we don't really provide that, but thank you MSF for coming in and you know having this on end for us. And um, the availability of the drug itself. Previously, sometimes we run out of drugs and we have to send our patient to other catchment areas for treatment. The day ended with everyone being educated on the challenges the country is facing with TB and how they can help in fighting the killer disease. Rayon Lakingu, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We go for another break. When we come back, we take a look at some stories making headlines overseas.
Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, West Australia is under red alert tonight as Cyclone Veronica storms in. Residents hunkering down amid warnings of flash flooding and wind gusts of more than 200 kilometres an hour. Veronica has vim and vigour. <laughs> The red alert for the area is in place for good reason. Destructive winds and torrential rain whipping up the sea, creating whitewash and chaos. Couple of birds up there. Hold on, birds. Hold on. The Category 3 cyclone is the biggest risk to Western Australia in a decade, and it's unusual because it's so slow moving. It's moving at anywhere between 8 and 10 kilometres an hour, which means that the destructive winds and the severe rain will be uh, in the area for a long period of time. More than 500 millimetres of rain only adding to the flood risk, parts of the region already underwater, hundreds without power, forced to run out the 80 kilometre wide system in the dark. Be patient and sit tight. I repeat, be patient and sit tight. The aptly named baby Veronica wasn't waiting, this woman giving birth in the middle of the storm. Some residents forced out of their homes to stay in emergency centres or with loved ones. Others wanting to get up close only to be moved on by police. Precious time and effort is put into dealing with these people who can't uh, follow simple instructions. This community now hunkering down. Waiting to see what damage Veronica will cause. A terrifying cruise on the coast of Norway has finally come to an end after the stricken ship made it back to port. The Viking Sky was travelling down the west coast of Norway when its engines failed in a major storm. Strong winds and massive waves battered the ship. Hundreds of passengers had to be evacuated by helicopter while others stayed on board until the ship was helped back to port. Caught in crashing waves off the coast of Norway, when the Viking Sky suffered engine failure yesterday afternoon, the luxury liner began to roll. On board, parts of the ceiling fell on passengers who dodged sliding tables, chairs and plants. Water all over the ground. Passengers have said that some of the ship's windows smashed and others filmed water rushing past their feet. Some queued to be evacuated, wearing orange life jackets. Helicopters winched over 400 people to safety, including injured and elderly passengers, airlifted in strong winds. George Davis and his wife were among them. Well, it's one of the most frightening moments I've had because the waves were just, you know, you, you just sort of lost it really and you couldn't quite work out where the ship was going. It was swimming everywhere and the wind was terrible and it was freezing cold. Back on land, passengers began to think about what they had witnessed. It just hit me the enormity and the potential disaster. We came so close. I thought this was it at that time. I mean, that's the water is going to rush in and, and, and this is it. The ship's operator, Viking Cruises, have said that 20 people were injured. Some have been taken to hospital. The company said that arrangements have been made to fly passengers home, with some leaving today. Nearly 900 people remained on board the liner, including Chris O'Connor. The idea of actually going, being hoisted up uh, to a heli helicopter in those winds, I didn't like that idea at all. Today, the liner was able to restart three of its four engines and made its way to the nearest port, pulling in this afternoon. At least one person was evacuated on a stretcher. Those on board were grateful for calm waters and to be back on dry land. The floral tribute in Christchurch got a special edition today, all the way from Hawaii. The giant lei was placed on the gate of the mosque as talk turns to what will happen to the thousands of flowers, messages and makeshift shrines around the city. Love and peace from another part of the Pacific. The lei of aloha flown here under strict quarantine, hand plaited in Hawaii from sacred tea leaves spanning more than a kilometre long. We feel the same pain, the same grief, uh, what happened instantly that day. Traffic brought to a standstill as part was walked to the mosque in silence, then hung in prayer. Mahalo, 
The lace split into pieces to be placed at mosques with emergency services, the hospital, Justice Precinct and Naitahu, all gifted apart. The floral carpet, which has become a voice for the grieving, grows by the day as talk turns to what will happen to tributes. The thought is to actually maybe compost the flowers and then working with the Muslim community to maybe use the compost in, in, in the mosque gardens. Another option being considered is to take several of the flower tributes and freeze them. But the council says nothing will happen for the next few weeks. It's just too soon. The university plans to scan and photograph cards and messages. But again, not yet, even with rain forecast this week. It's so important for everybody you know who hasn't seen them yet they want to see those so we can't really take them away as yet. Those still providing the bouquet say there's no let up in demand. It's been so full on all 10 days it's been non-stop. It's been different um, it's been emotional for the staff um, so th there isn't a comparison. And no tribute wall like it either, one that will stay as it is for now. To the US and President Donald Trump is claiming victory and hitting back hard, but revelations from the much-awaited Mueller report are raising even more questions. Robert Mueller's investigation, which took nearly two years, found no collusion between Mr Trump's campaign and Russia in the run-up to the 2016 election. No collusion, no obstruction and total exoneration, the US president tweeted. Donald Trump also called the inquiry on illegal takedown that failed. But a summary of the report does not exonerate him from obstruction of justice. Relap on the tarmac. It was just announced there was no collusion with Russia, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Donald Trump claiming complete vindication in the 22-month investigation that has dogged his presidency. There's so many people have been so badly hurt. Special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation finding no evidence that the Trump campaign conspired with Russia to influence the 2016 presidential election, despite, quote, multiple offers from Russian-affiliated individuals to assist. And so it's come Complete exoneration, no collusion, no obstruction. Thank you very much. Technically, the president is correct, but on the question of whether he obstructed justice, special counsel Robert Mueller says, while this report doesn't conclude that the president committed a crime, it also doesn't exonerate him. Instead, Mueller left it up to America's attorney general to decide, and William Barr telling Congress there wasn't enough evidence to indict. It's a shame that our country had to go through this. It's a shame that your president has had to go through this for before I even got elected. For nearly two years, this investigation has enraged Donald Trump, casting a cloud over his presidency. He's attacked it as a hoax and a witch hunt. This was an illegal takedown that failed. The Democrats, though, aren't relenting. Vowing to investigate the investigation, they're demanding a full release of Mueller's report and the underlying documents to Congress. As much information can be, as can be made public should be made public without delay. And Nadler's promising to summon Attorney General William Barr to testify on Capitol Hill in the meantime. His conclusions raise more questions than the answer. Given the fact that Mueller uncovered evidence that, in his own words, does not exonerate the president. But the president can now claim these investigations are just political games. Today is a significant turning point for his administration. Thank you very much. Thank you. For Donald Trump, it's full steam ahead to 2020. A special service in Poland has commemorated the 75th anniversary of the wartime prison break that inspired the film The Great Escape. The brave getaway saw 76 Allied servicemen turn out of the Stalag Luft III camp. They had hoped to frustrate the war effort with the largest ever mass escape. But 50 of those who tunneled out of captivity would never be reunited with friends and families. The German Gestapo, acting on orders from Hitler, murdered most of the 76 great escapers. Today, members of the RAF police, who launched a post-war hunt for the killers, took part in a tribute to the airmen. When the first tunnel was discovered, they kept going. Uh, when they thought they were going to be hampered by the weather, 
they've kept going. And there was that determination there. The forest is steadily reclaiming Starlag Luft III, but this is a story which endures, in part, through Hollywood. Working in secret, teams of prisoners had spent months tunnelling through the sandy soil, whilst others prepared civilian clothes and forged identity papers. Thanks to the efforts of local Polish volunteers, it's still possible to get a taste of what the real-life escapers went through. This reconstruction may not contain the hazards of the Great Escape Tunnel, but it does give me a real sense of the claustrophobia and the effort that must have been needed to haul those men a hundred metres to the tunnel exit. When you get to the bottom of the shaft, you will be put on I will get onto a trolley and you will be hauled up to the other end. You also know that there are people going out steadily or not so steadily according to what the goons are doing on the outside of the wire. Richard Churchill died a few weeks ago, the last survivor of the breakout. But the escapers' stories are still being passed on. Back home and for close to 50 years, the name John Mummis has been synonymous with Papua New Guinea politics. From playing an integral part in drawing up Papua New Guinea's constitution, to his efforts during and after the Bougainville crisis in promoting peace, Mummis was recognised for his services to politics in 2005 when bestowed with the Grand Companion of the Order of Logohu. Chief John Mummis is now nearing the end of his second term as President of the Autonomous Region of Bougainville. By law, he cannot run again for election. So what's next for Chief John Mummis? I spoke to him recently at his home in Buin, South Bougainville. It has been a long political career for Chief John Mummis. 2019 marks 47 years since this former Catholic priest was first elected into the House of Assembly as member for Bougainville and subsequently playing a crucial role in drafting the constitution of Papua New Guinea. Over the years, he has remained a constant influence in PNG politics and still demands respect wherever he goes. Since the formation of the autonomous Bougainville government in 2005, he has also remained as a lasting influence with Chief Momis elected as ABG president in 2010 and again in 2015, which by law is his last term in office. But what's next for Chief John Momis? I asked him at his residence in Buin, South Bougainville. Once you do retire from politics, what's next for Chief John Momis? Ah. Difficult to say, but um, of course I'll have to finish my book. I'm very grateful. I had a very uh, uh, long and in-depth involvement in the evolution of the democratic system of government. I believe I'm a democrat. I believe in uh, democr democracy, human rights, justice, peace. And during the recent first round of referendum awareness, President Momis used the opportunity to promote unity and democracy, two traits which he says are crucial for lasting peace on Bougainville. Through a large part of his political journey, his wife, Lady Elizabeth, has been by his side. According to President Momis, their journey in their personal life, much like his political career, has been made possible through unity and commitment. Your lovely wife has always stood beside you. How do you keep this relationship going for such a long time? Well, I think it's um, uh, for any um, for any for any of us who are involved in anything to do with teamwork uh, uh, appreciates uh, collaboration. Appreciate that uh, you know. It's a team spirit, collaboration, partnership is very important. And it's the same in marriage, same in anything we do in the country. Unless we're a partnership, unless we collaborate, critical cooperation, I call it. You know, we don't just say yes and no, but we critically analyze things and critically decide to collaborate for a higher good, you know, and the, the higher good for us. Whilst Chief John Momis has just over 12 months left in public office, he's focusing on ensuring that the upcoming referendum exercise on Bougainville is conducted freely, fairly and in peace, in line with the Bougainville Peace Agreement. What, what is your message to Bougainvillians on Bougainville now as well as Bougainvillians outside as we prepare for this important date? 
My message to the people of Bougainville is to unite. We must put aside our differences and we must joyfully celebrate the process that now belongs to us. Here with National MTV News, we go for another break. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Drukai Sports. We begin with athletics. Pacific Sprint Queen Toy Whistle finished 7th on Saturday at the Queensland Track Classic in Brisbane. She ran slower than at the National Trials, but still faster than her Pacific Games medal win in 2015. She also finished 3rd in her 200-meter race. Whistle and Hurdler, Ephraim Lurkin, took part in the Track Classic and both will be going to Sydney for the Australian National Championships. Pacific Sprint Queen Toya Whistle and Hurdler, Ephraim Lekin, competed at the Queensland Track Classic in Brisbane on Saturday evening. The Classic is one of the premier events of the Australian domestic calendar and the last major event before the season closes with the national championships in Sydney. It was not a good outing for Whistle, who was in lane 9 and finished 7th overall in her race. Toya started off well but could not maintain a solid finish clocking 11.76 seconds in the 100-meter race. She also took part in the 200 meters, clocking a time of 24.38 seconds and finishing third. Toya ran a time of 11.57 seconds and 11.59 seconds in two separate 100-meter races during the Pacific Games trials in Kimber, West New Britain, before leaving for Brisbane. Both those times were better than what she ran at the Track Classic. Toya has a personal best of 11.26 seconds and during the Pacific Games in 2015 ran 11.86 seconds to win gold for Papua New Guinea in the 100 meters. So Toya is still running good times despite being sidelined by the PNG Olympic Committee last year. Fellow athlete Ephraim Lurkin was competing in the first race of the year in his favorite event, the 400 meter hurdles. Lurkin, seen here in the orange singlet, struggled with timing his jumps and landing, slowing him down. He finished fifth with a time of 51.98 seconds, which is just outside his personal best of 51.56 seconds. The 21-year-old from Simberry Island, New Island province, was disappointed not to post a faster time. We still will remain in Brisbane for the next 10 days and prepare for the Australian National Championships in Sydney where she will run the 100 meters only. The duo will travel to Sydney on April the 3rd and return to Goroka on April the 8th. Fidelis Sukina, National MTV Sports. PNG Sports Foundation CEO Peter Chiamalili Jr. says more programs will be created under high-performance sports to suit PNG's elite athletes. He says with a justification committee under PNG Olympic Committee, athletes are now able to give back on the work of high performance and how they can better improve their services to cater for the needs of all athletes. With high performance services fully utilized by national federations in the country, athletes are able to access quality information and training similar to what international athletes would go through in preparations for any international events. One of the ways in which we've identified and started getting some feedback from how our team is performing is the Olympic Committee has a justification committee that is now justifying athletes going to the Pacific Games and um, they are assessing the, the, some of the concerns and addressing some of the concerns that the athletes are, are bringing back to the justification committee in respect to the high performance training. Sports Foundation CEO Peter Chimalili Jr. says there are things that Sports Foundation needs to work on and improve for the betterment of all athletes but it is the results and feedback that can only bring about change and improvement on certain areas of what is being done at the high performance center. Uh, because the dynamic of sport is that we just need to be always at the edge of how we're practicing and how we're mentoring and teaching our, uh, our athletes this continuous evolution. 
with PNG Sports Foundation ensuring that services required to creating quality athletes are provided, Chimaleli says it is an evolving process and it will only get better. We are getting more Papua New Guineans and skilled up in particular with strength and conditioning, with, with diet, psychology, um, and particularly with even with physio uh, physiotherapists, so all these different skills, uh, you know, they're, they're they're key to developing a a key, a key athlete or, or a sound athlete going forward. So, Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere. Trukai Sports will continue after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports to Super Rugby. Now it looks like All Blacks captain Kieran Reid will make his long-awaited comeback to rugby this Friday. Reid is said to be named in the Crusaders squad for this week's local showdown against the Hurricanes. This after a four-month break away from rugby. Crusaders training today featured Kieran Reid leading again, this time after a rare loss. The session followed by four words to warm the hearts of all Crusaders fans. He's available for selection. Reid hasn't played since the All Blacks test against Italy back at the end of November. His back's feeling good and he's feeling good mentally as well, which is even more important. Owen Franks ruled out late of the loss to the Waratahs is also good to go for the local derby. And another of the Crusaders' all-star pack returns. A standout in the first half dozen rounds before last week's enforced All Blacks break. Not doing the rugby content, you're not going to the meetings, you're not doing the planning stuff that you usually would, so mentally you're refreshed. So will any Crusaders All Blacks be rested this week? No one. Including midfielder Jack Goodhue given special clearance to play. In Kane's country at the Porniki Club, All Blacks Dane Coles, Nani Lamape and a new look TJ Pedinara are all back. There's three boys that have had their week uh, their week's rest and are pretty energised. Just four weeks ago the Crusaders beat the Hurricanes by 16 points. That now seems a distant memory. Especially for lower hut boy Chase Tiatia who's set to play in his first Canes Crusaders derby just three games into his young career. They, they named the team every week and they got to number 14 and they named Geordie Barrett on 14 so I was like oh shit who, who, who are they playing at fullbacks? New boys and test stars are all in the mix then. The mouth-watering meeting in the capital will decide who rules the local conference. Kieran Reid's timing looks perfect. And finally to the NRL a couple of NRL league veterans have brought the New Zealand Warriors back down to earth playing in his 17th season. Tigers hooker Robbie Farah's pinpoint cutout pass, setting up their first try. More quick thinking, close to the line, kept exposing the Warriors' weak right side. And his experience proving too much to handle for some poor Warriors defence. As they get to the last, Farah... I think we sort of, you know, made it easy for them. Um, um, you know, we gifted them field position and just weren't prepared to, you know, get ourselves dirty enough. Benji Marshall getting in on the fun too, with the Tigers romping to a 36-4 victory. Uh, the Warriors now face a testing week ahead, playing the Manly Sea Eagles in Christchurch. Two motorcyclists in Costa Rica have been banned for two years following this bizarre incident at their national champs. It all started with the pair jostling for position, but instead of continuing the rivalry on his own bike, one rider clings onto the others. It could have led to a crash, but ended up like this. Pierre thrown off the track after their dust-up, the bands taking into account not just the antics and the danger to themselves and others, but where this riderless bike, uh, in fact, could have ended up. And that ends Strook Eye Sports for this evening. We go for a quick break and be back with the weather details for the next 24 hours. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG.
A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Fine weather expected in Popandeta, mostly fine for Alota. Cloudy weather in Daru and Kerama and a shower or two with a top of 32 degrees expected in Port Moresby. To the Ngomasi region, mostly fine in Leh with a top temperature of 32 degrees, 27 degrees and some showers expected in Nuao. Mostly fine and 32 degrees for Medang, Wewak and Vanimore. To the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine in Loranga with a top of 32, 32 degrees and some showers expected in Kaviang and Buka. Some showers and a top of 31 degrees for Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, all the major centres, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabe can expect mostly fine weather over the next 24 hours. To a look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours, waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama, Yul Island Hood Point to Samurai Island, and waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel, Finchafen, and waters of Finchafen through Vitius and Dampier Strait to Siasi Island, to Long Island, Medang, Bogia, and waters of New Britain to New Island and Bougainville sea 0 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of Eastern and Western Milne Bay Island sea 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. And waters of Bogia to Wewak, Aitape, Vanimo, and the northern PNG Indonesian border. And waters of Manus in its western group of islands to Musau and New Hanover Islands seas 1.5 to 2 meters. And a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas, Coral Sea, sea slight with southeast to southwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Solomon Sea, sea slight with northeast to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Bismarck Sea, sea slight to moderate with west to southwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. And the Pacific Ocean, sea slight to moderate with west to northwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that has been the news, sport and weather for today, Monday the 25th of March 2019. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.